Welcome everybody to our 30th Open Clock Club and today we've got a special treat for everybody because it is our York Festival of Ideas special for beginners. So super special warm welcome to, um, to people who are joining us for the first time and um, particularly if you are thinking about or ever considered or something to do with a craft like clock repair it doesn't necessarily have to be clock repair um, because as we will discover over the next hour or so um, that when you get to fix a clock there's all sorts of great and wonderful opportunities that uh, that arise anyway so my name is Matthew Reed and I'm joined uh, this evening by our normal support this for people who are joining us for the first time uh, the York Festival of Ideas people. This is actually a regular weekly meeting. We plan to do a year's worth of meetings or thereabouts, and we're about two thirds of the way through that process. Um, do please remember that this event is recorded. So the recording of the event will go on our YouTube archive. And if it's okay, I'll send people um, a link to that. So if anybody, again, uh, new people, maybe beginners, if you're thinking of making notes when we get to the bit where we actually start taking a clock to clock apart, hopefully, uh, then you don't really need to do because you'll be able to revisit the recording. But uh, anyway, I'll send you a link to that. And because it's a recurring event, those of you that signed up through Eventbrite, if you want to uh, stop getting emails about this event, then uh, just go back to the event by Eventbrite page and unsubscribe yourself or send us an email and we'll do it for you. OK, so what are we about here? Well, um, uh, we're going to split this, this uh, session into three broad areas. One is going to be the background to how you get started in clock repair. The second part of it is going to be actually taking a clock apart. And I'll talk about the names. We're going to be jargon free, uh, hopefully. I suppose it depends what you mean by jargon. Uh, but <laughs> I get fined for every bit of clocks jargon I use. So that'll make everybody smile. It's going to try and be jargon free. Uh, within reason anyway, to keep people on board. So what are we about? Well, um, I've been involved in the uh, the sort of horological world, the clock world is horology, a bit of jargon probably is, um, for kind of most of my adult life, really. Uh, I'm a third generation retail jeweler and my grandfather here in York at a um, scientific instrument makers called Cook, Troughton and Sims was uh, worked there during the war. So that's kind of where it stems from. Long, very long story short. And when I was in my 20s, I was a retailer of um, jewellery and the kind of clocks itch would not disappear. Um, there were a few tools kicking around uh, left over from my grandfather's period. And anyway, so I decided to get involved in, in clock repair. I was really interested in it, but I really struggled to get what I call basic information. Of course, there's no such thing as basic information, but just information about how to get started. I found, and this is well, more 30 years ago now, so I, I'm sure things have changed for the better, but I found those, you know, some um, kind of obstruction, maybe some sucking through teeth about you need this tool and that tool and things uh, called lathes. I didn't know what a lathe was and all that. So once I became established or more established um, with my co-author, John Butt, we decided to write a book for beginners. Uh, believe it or not, we didn't think there was another book on the market like it that really dug into how to get started. The book is uh, up there in the corner of the shot and you can buy it on uh, eBay or on Amazon. Uh, there's Ken. Is he got his <laughs> Yay, Ken's got his book. Well done. Thank you, Ken. So, um, and everybody else was bought a book. That keeps, keeps the fairy lights on. So, uh, so we wrote a book and it took ages. And, and, and the reason for that is because we started actually by talking about um, what we call French clocks, sort of 19th century uh, clocks that tell the time and strike the hours. And we spent quite a few years writing about those. 
and realized that actually that wasn't a really useful place for people to begin. Um, so what we did was we found uh, this clock here and uh, I'll just move that out of the shot. Um, we found this clock, which is um, a, a 20th century, sorry, the camera angle is not quite wide enough to get the whole thing in, move out a little bit. Um, 20th century, uh, this happens to be an English made one, a European uh, timepiece clock. So it's a spring driven, it's a mechanical clock, not battery, not electric, um, but a mechanically driven clock, spring driven, uh, that's just got one set of mechanism that powers the hands around. And this is, you might hear it referred to as a timepiece. We call it single train clock, but anyway, and we thought, great, this is a relatively inexpensive way. I'll just pop that down there. Relatively inexpensive way of people getting off the starting line. And this is like one of the biggest questions that people ask, which reminds me two things before I get started. Um, Team Open Clock Club are managing the live chat here. So if you haven't used Zoom before, if you look at the Zoom toolbar, there's a function on mine, it's hidden under the word more, like a drop down uh, menu, but something called live chat. If you click on the live chat, you can actually talk to other members of this group and they're all super friendly and also to Team Open Clock Club. So you can ask questions. And that's what the third part of this session is gonna be about. It's gonna be about trying to answer questions. I'll try to do some as we go along. But um, one of those questions is, how much does it cost to get started? Perfectly reasonable question and actually a really difficult thing uh, to answer. Um, but these clocks, and of course, I totally get it that at all cost is relative. Um, these clocks are relatively uh, inexpensive considering they're, some of them are getting on to be a hundred years old or an antique. Um, it's kind of a reliable way in. And yes, you will need some hand tools and we'll talk about those, but um, please again, ask about that in the live chat. So this is kind of slightly controversial, um, but we wanted to, uh, and this might obviously is kind of a lot of money to a lot of people. We wanted to people, people to be able to buy a clock, maybe buy a copy of our book, but that's not um, mandatory of course, and buy some hand tools and what you need to get started for less than a hundred pounds, which is a significant amount of money. Um, however, the message in other parts of horology is it costs a lot more than that. So make what you will of that. We've tried to keep it as uh, inexpensive as possible. And I'm sure you can do it cheaper, but we've had members of our group um, who have done it much cheaper than that, buying tools and things off eBay and so on. Um, a good point there, that if you buy your hand tools, and we're really happy to help support you in you know, thinking about that, um, then if you look after them, typically you might get your money back if you sell them again on an internet auction site or something. And the same applies for these clocks, actually. They tend to kind of hold their value in, in case... <laughs> Since our book was published, they've probably gone up by about three pounds, but anyway. Um, speaking of tools, the most exciting thing about tonight, and I'll tell you now so we can get it out of the way, is that one of our um, followers, our members, really kindly donated some hand tools. So there's a list of them on our Facebook page, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, but there's all sorts in there. There's uh, cutter pliers, a bit, a few consumables, some saw blades, watch make a screwdriver, a whole lot of stuff, um, really useful stuff. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna post that uh, a collection of tools, wherever you live in the world, out for free. And to enter our tool draw competition, find the live chat function on Zoom and just, cause your name is there already, just type the words tool competition. Okay, if you go to the live chat, Type the words cool to tool competition, um, open clock club team, nodding there, will uh, put you in the draw. And before we close this evening, we will draw a name out of our hat 
and um, you can direct messages and tell us your address and we'll send the tools off. So there you go. So Tool Competition, thank you so much for the person that donated those tools. Really generous. So there's two things there. One is getting a clock to work on, and the other one is the tools and equipment you need to work on that clock. And so typically they are both kind of, um, you know, their outlay, their, their costs. And a kind of word of warning really, um, is that the minute you sort of uh, talk about being interested in clock repair, people will say to you, oh, I've got a clock. Um, would you mind having a look at that or repairing it? And my strongest advice is to politely but gently say no, because inevitably, as a beginner, if you get into problems, they're then going to say, is that clock ready? Is it done? You might inadvertently damage something, and it can really turn quite horrible so my strongest advice find a clock in a charity shop or a thrift store or on the internet and uh, work on your own uh, own stuff at least for the first two or three cycles then if everything goes really badly wrong or you just get bored with it and the clock's in bits it's not the end of the world so that would be my advice to you and that uh, leads me neatly on to the next point and that's health and safety. And there are really two areas of health and safety that are really important here. One, as you will see in a, in a while, is that to clean our clock once it's disassembled, we use or I use mineral spirits. So that's either white spirits or paraffin, which is called kerosene, I think, in the States. Um, and like any uh, solvent like that, it must be treated with care, it must be stored safely out of the reach of children um, in a fireproof container and disposed of responsibility responsibly. So that's the first thing that if you're going to clean a clock uh, this way, then you need some kind of space. And that's the typical, um, the typical kind of second question that people ask us is that, you know, can I realistically get into clock repair at home. Now, many of our members and followers work from home. They either have got a converted garage or a spare room. Uh, like me, I work from home too. And yes, it's possible. But of course, once you start using tools and equipment, uh, particularly if you develop and you start doing things like soldering and you've got solvents, you must pay um, a reasonable respect to health and safety uh, legislation. And um, remember, we're not only responsible for our own health and safety, but the health and safety of those around us. So how, however our practice impacts on, on that. So the one thing are things like solvent storage, uh, use and disposal of solvents. There's a really, if you're not in this field, never worked in the kind of, um, uh, field of mechanics or science or anything, then there's an incredibly useful bit of paper you can buy. And in England, I don't know whether it's the same in the States, I'm sure one of our people can tell us, it's called the COSH assessment, that's C-O-S-H-H. It's Control of Substances Hazardous to Health. So every manufacturer must, at least in Europe, I guess, by law, um, provide a safety data sheet, SDS, for their chemical. So if you go to the DIY shop, as I just did this afternoon, and I bought this substance, which is white spirit, low odor white spirit, which is what we wash our clocks in, then if you go online, the manufacturer must, maybe even the shop, I don't know, by law, um, provide you with a downloadable PDF or something like that. And that will give you a whole lot of useful guidance on how to store exposure limits, that kind of thing, and dispose of that product. It'll also tell you to a degree uh, what's in it as well. So COSHH, care, um, control of substances, hazards to health, and a safety data sheet is incredibly useful. The second element of health and safety that I want to talk about is what lies in here and it's a like one of the most common kind of problems that we come across uh, for the beginner that they totally understandably buy a clock that's spring driven so there are obviously there are all sorts of ways that clocks are powered 
do a little bit of a drawing in a bit. Um, and also the way clocks are powered, the two most common ones with mechanical clocks are either driven by weights, like a grandfather clock or a tall case clock or a long case clock. Um, so uh, you wind up the weights uh, and that is an energy store which drives the clock over the duration of running. And the second, maybe not more common, but uh, the second uh, method of storing energy, the motive force, is a coiled spring. And I'm just looking round for one, just happen to have one here. Um, so here's the um, mechanism of a clock, not dissimilar from the one that uh, we're going to be looking at this evening. And um, I'll just put my gloves on. In about 20 years ago, I uh, left the dark world of um, clock repair and uh, moved to the even darker world of clock conservation. And we could have a lifetime's discussion about what the difference is. Um, but you'll see, uh, typically, I try and always wear these disposable nitrile gloves when handling metal objects. So these, I'll put the uh, um, up here so you can see it, the make of them, for your, just your typical powder-free nitrile disposable gloves, because the um, acid from your fingers is corrosive to metal. So you'll notice um, if you watch conservators on the television, they usually use those white cotton gloves, which are actually kind of a bit old fashioned now, but they look good on film. Uh, anyway, that's what that's about. So here's a, a clock mechanism. Uh, it's not dissimilar to the one that we're going to be looking at. And I've taken out all the other components apart from this one that you can see here. And the reason I've left this in here is because it's within this component and you can see it's a cylinder of metal. We call it the barrel um, for obvious reasons. This one is not always like this, but happens to have some teeth on the periphery. Just zoom in a wee bit so you can see better. Got some teeth on the periphery and hiding inside here, and I'll take it apart in a minute, you can have a look, is a spring. So this is um, a helical, no, it's not. This is a um, spiral spring, um, coiled uh, strip of hardened and tempered steel. And it's that spring that stores the energy for the clock running over the dur whatever its duration is. In this case, it's actually two weeks, so uh, 15 days, even though the clock is normally worn every uh, week or so. So let's just have a look at this. Um, Let's get some pliers. As always, uh, the, the issue is just, uh, why nitrile gloves and not another material? Uh, and both have said nitriles are unreactive, don't set up allergies. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, there are vinyl gloves available, but some people are, um, yeah, have an allergic reaction, very negative re allergic reaction to those. And also nitrile are reasonably chemical resistant. The other type that we use when we're actually doing the cleaning, you'll see uh, in a bit, are slightly thicker, but they'll resist most kind of household solvents that you're likely to come across. Seem to have got a shirt collar problem as well. Um, so let's just take out this um, mainspring barrel here. And um, you can just see inside there, peeking inside there, is uh, the coiled spring. Now, I've just taken this apart and the, the whole thing looks incredibly benign. But when the clock is wound and running, there's an enormous amount of stored energy in here. And you have to release that energy safely. Otherwise, you'll have an accident can be damaging to property, as in the clock, but probably more importantly, can be damaging to your uh, fingers or eyes or face. So you'll notice that when we deal with, um, with the, the mainspring in the second half of this uh, session, uh, there we are, in the second half of this session, that I'm going to be using safety gloves and safety goggles as well. So there we are, a little summary on the health and safety side of things. There's one thing with the solvents that we might use. And there are water-based solvents available. Personally, I'm not a great fan of them for reasons that we can go into uh, later maybe. And um, so I prefer the, um, the spirit-based, mineral spirit-based ones. And then the other one are mainsprings because mainsprings can be really 
uh, kind of nasty. It looks very benign here, but believe me, um, believe me, it's not. Uh, let's just actually flip the top off that main spring barrel so you can just have a look inside. I'll just put on my safety glasses. And uh, you can see here, let's just have a look at the talk about the anatomy. We'll get back to this in session two here, but the anatomy of this component. Um, now, the, we chose these mid 20th century clocks. Um, they're really great because, as I said, I totally get that it's all relative, um, but they're relatively inexpensive, relatively numerous. Um, and the thing about them is if you learn and begin on one of these, you kind of learn 80 to 90 percent of everything there is to know about every mechanical clock that's ever been made, because there's so many common kind of components. Um, just one thing I'll point out here before we just flip the top off, and that is, you may notice here, I'll get my use my pointy stick, around these two components, there is some yucky looking oily substance. And that is oil that has either degraded or gotten contaminated with dust from the environment. And that yucky contaminated oil is the primary reason why you'd ever want to take a clock apart. And when I say clean it, I mean wash it, but everybody calls it cleaning it. So let's call it that for sake of argument. Why do I want to clean a clock? Well, the reason you want to clean a clock is to get rid of that contaminated lubricant and replace it with fresh. And you can really only do that by taking the thing apart. So I'll just uh, flip this barrel cover off. And there we see our mainspring inside. Now I've let the power off this mainspring safely when it was in relation to the clock mechanism or the movement as it's called. But believe it or not, there's still a lot of stored energy in here. And if you were to try and remove this uh, spring from this uh, container, the barrel, without specialist tools and control and safety measures, you could do yourself uh, a lot of injury. We do, there's a video on our YouTube channel about it. So what we do in our book is we make what we feel is a reasonable adjustment for the beginner. And that's actually to clean the clock. Remember, this is for a beginner without removing the mainspring from the barrel. Um, I'm not sure I can do it here. I don't want to go too far off piste today. There we are. Um, maybe not quite the time to talk about it, but you can see this component here, which is called the barrel arbor. Um, the winding key goes on here. He said, uh, looking around for his winding key, which I've got somewhere, all beautifully prepared. disappeared in the mountain of clock parts. And uh, the mainspring hooks on this bit here. So we can remove this component and wash it. You can see how uh, much dirty oil there is on there and replace it. And yeah, it might not be um, thought of as best practice if you're a professional practitioner, but um, the reality is what we want to do is we want to give beginners every encouragement to repair their first clock in safety. Um, we want to kind of, not that anything can be guaranteed, but guarantee a successful outcome. Okay. Now, before I go on to, um, yeah, we're nearly a third of the way through. Before we go on to actually start taking our clock apart, are there any questions from? Uh, no, just uh, David Shish was saying, can't find um, the Sunfields on eBay anymore. Right, okay, we've cornered the market. Do have a few kind of like a little stash if anybody wants to buy one at a premium price. Um, I did think of, there's a, I, I won't go off piece, but the clock I've just shown you, or the mechanism, has, uh, as I said before, the one that we strongly recommend you begin with, doesn't have to be a Smith's make, there are other makes as well that are the same, is just a timepiece. So it's one mechanism in there, one spring, one set of gears, and uh, that and that's it. 
But strangely, because they were presumably made in much bigger quantities, the clocks that are very similar, but with two trains, two mainsprings, two gears, if you like, that strike the hours and the half hours are much more plentiful. But anyway, that's for another day. OK, before I start taking the clock apart, support. So when we wrote our book a um, year ago and finished it a year ago or something, um, it coincided with lockdown, which was kind of quite interesting. Uh, what we realized was that um, there was a lot of people out there from all around the world who uh, maybe could benefit from being as, uh, in a community. And so we started a Facebook group. Uh, if you Google how to repair pendulum clocks, Facebook group, everybody's welcome there. It's primarily for beginners, but we do go off in all kinds of tangents. And uh, a lot of very helpful and well-informed people. So irrespective of where you are, um, please feel free to join that group and we will try and get you started the best we can. There are also a couple of YouTube channels as well. You'll, you'll find those by Googling, which you've got some videos on. And we do a live stream as well on a Thursday evening, uh, British summertime, where we're repairing a tall case clock. So there's quite a lot to be getting on with. However, back to this evening. So I'm just gonna check my notes and make sure I've kind of got everything. Right. OK, so some of the questions that we had written down, a really great question from one of our um, our supporters was, you know, is it realistic to get a clock, take it apart, clean it, put it back together again? Yes and no is the answer. I'm not going to say that it's for everybody. What I would like to do is to encourage everybody at least to have a go uh, doing it safely. Um, what environment do I need? Well, you need a space, obviously. Um, the, some of the parts are quite small, so things like storage is useful. We recommend for beginners again that you maybe use a compartmentalized plastic box with a lid to keep everything nice and neat and clean. Um, and as I've already said, you need, if you're using solvents to clean the mechanism, then you need a safe place to store those and you need somewhere to dispose of them. But I think, I'm, again, I love to hear what our kind of more regular readers uh, listeners and followers think you know i i work from a spare room and make videos here and do the clock repairs and everything and it's yeah it's pretty um uh pretty small space but it it works fine for me workshops are great but again i don't want to put people off by saying you need this space in this workshop and so on but do bear in mind health and safety uh, if you're living in a space where other people are there as well. Okay, so we're going to have um, a two minute comfort break now, and we're going to come back at half past. I won't rush because that's just under two minutes. So we'll meet you back at half past, and then we'll start to take the clock apart. Don't forget, don't forget tool competition in the live chat if you want entering for that. So see you in a couple of minutes.
Right, um, welcome back everybody. And uh, so a second part of our York Festival of Ideas special uh, to encourage beginners to get into clock repair. Now, before I just start on this, um, we were talking uh, before about the kind of, um, oh, come on, camera. We were talking about, just like that one bit. There we are. Um, what you get out of clock repairing, and I suppose stating the, um, the blindingly obvious, you uh, can repair clocks. Is it realistic that I can repair clocks? You know, we get a lot of people who uh, say, I've never done anything practical. I've got no engineering background, don't really have any tools. Can you get that? And it's not really for me to answer that uh, because I kind of had a bit of a head start with it, but I certainly, I've had students when I used to teach who come from totally non-technical background. Whole conversation there about the sciences and the arts. I don't believe they're separate things. I think the kind of thinking uh, is all interchangeable and squidged, squidged around. Um, so, yeah, you can repair clocks, but in a way, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg because, um, as, as I've already alluded to, uh, it's a great community to be part of. You know, we've got people, just our little brand, got people all over the world. I'd say uh, 600 people, I think, uh, on Facebook now. And it's just really great. Hopefully it's fun. It keeps people connected. So that whole societal community vibe is really important, I think. The other thing is that when you repair a clock, like developing any kind of craft skill, you just see the world in a totally different way. And that sounds a bit um, over ambitious, but because we deal with things like material manipulation, so soldering, hardening metals, softening metals, filing, hammering, you name it, you look at other things and they just appear completely different. And that's a process that can't be undone. And you think I can fix that. That's the other great joy of becoming a clock repairer is if you've ever thought that you want to like to be able to fix more things around the home or at work or on your car or whatever it is on your bike um, all of a sudden a whole world opens up to you where the tools that you buy for clock making some of them anyway and the materials and the glues and the lubricants are really useful for fixing things there are examples here every day where there are things that I repair and mend and help people out with um, that I couldn't do if I hadn't gotten into clock repairing. So it's really good. There's a whole well-being uh, issue of craft, of course, which is really useful and supportive. Um, the sort of meditative, sometimes it's frustrating, but other times it's incredibly meditative. And that idea of satisfaction when you get uh, an object like this and you bring it back to life, as people say, you know, you, you give it a new lease of life. Many things I think we've repaired recently where I've kind of thought if I didn't do that, it isn't ever going to get done, which may or may not be true, of course. In England, we've got a television program called The Repair Shop. I don't know whether you've got that in other parts of the world, but it's incredibly popular and it's popular because of the stories that surround historic objects. So this clock um, is, uh, you know, you might describe it as a modest clock, but every object has its story and you can become part of that story and it can be great fun and as I said supportive so lots of pluses to clock repair it's maybe not the uh, cheapest or easiest hobby to begin but I said really um, really uh, recommend people uh, at least have a go so here's our clock um, you've seen the the front um, the, uh, the it's got a glass over the uh, dial it's the dial I mean I'm not hung up on terminology, but clocks, people call it the dial, not the face and the hands, not the fingers. Um, this chrome plated bit of metal is called the bezel. And uh, then we've got a minute hand, and an hour hand and a dial plate there. Uh, let's just have a quick look in the back. Uh, you can see the glass is actually already got a little crack in it there. We've used this clock over the weeks. It's got a Bakelite case, which is kind of quite interesting too bit of textile um, in the back here. So you can see already that you might think clocks are sort of, you know, mechanics. And this is something that I try and 
sort of push back on a little bit. Yes, of course, there are mechanics, but actually there's a whole range of materials that play in most of the clocks. You can see here, we've got modern materials like plastics. We've also got textiles, we've got painted surfaces, we've got silk screen. So there's a whole lot going on here. Uh, we've got some aluminium in there, some steel and some brass. So here's the mechanism. I'll just try and move it so you can see it. So here's the mechanism. As I said, we call this the movement and we're gonna remove this from the case in a short while. And the part that I removed to stop it from clanging around is this component here, which is part of the pendulum. Okay, so a little bit of a um, very uh, rapid introduction to clocks like this, to mechanical clocks. There are three broad elements to this clock. One, uh, we've already had a quick look at it, the motive force. So the clock needs something to keep it running during the period it runs for a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever it is. And that's normally either a weight or a spring. People um, involved with modern clocks, of course, they'll be more familiar with a battery to keep the clock running. It does exactly the same job. It's a power source, motive uh, store of energy to keep the clock running. In this case, it's a spring. Then we'll see in a bit, we've got some gears. Uh, we call this a gear train. Uh, think of a gear box in the car. Uh, those gears, um, sometimes it's useful to have a bit of math and we go through that in these sessions. But basically what the gears do is that they give the clock duration. Obviously it's not convenient to wind it one minute, then have to wind it again in half an hour. It's useful if a clock runs for a day, typically a week, something like that. And it also means that the uh, indicator, in this case, pair of hands, go round at some kind of meaningful rate. And that can be all sorts. You get clocks with moon, calendar, um, uh, like this, the date, um, all sorts of different indications. And that is down to gearing. Then the third element of our clock here, if you've ever had one of those uh, wind up mechanical toys, like a frog that swims about in the bath or a train set in the old days showing my age now, when you wind them up, they kind of go really fast, then they go slower and slower and slower and slower. And that's because they don't have any way of regulating, well, they don't have any way per se of regulating the speed. Well, the clock does, because of course you don't want your clock to run really fast at the beginning of the week and slow at the end. And that is the pendulum in this case. The pendulum, without getting into jargon, is what the physicists call the oscillator. And you'll have seen on, uh, pendulum you'll have seen on all sorts of films and cartoons you name it that the pendulum swings backwards and forwards you can see it in there let's just hook it on in an oscillating kind of action like that and it's the oscillation of natural period of oscillation of that pendulum that makes the clock keep even time so three elements motive power gears uh, with an indicator and then our oscillator. If you've ever looked inside the back of a mechanical watch or a, an alarm clock, you see a different kind of oscillator. It's like a wheel, a balance. Uh, some people call it the balance wheel. The name is the balance, which is controlled by a balance spring. Anyway, so we want to get access to our mechanism here. And you can see there are screws uh, in here and there are some nuts on here and we could start taking these apart but that might end in disaster. What we need to do first is to remove the hands because the hands are obviously fixed to the mechanism. So there are, um, might be an actual idea, probably won't do it, but to put a sort of blanket or towel or something on this surface, just to give the clock a bit of um, support, stop it from scratching. So you can see here, we've got two hands. Sometimes clocks have got three, many more combinations, sometimes just one hand. And there are primarily two ways of those hands being fixed on. One, like this here, is with a little pin that goes through the middle. Don't know if you can see that. Let's just try zoom right in and uh, focus that. You can see there's a little kind of cross pin and a washer, which is actually loose here. That washer, the clocks, people call that a collet. But anyway, let's call it a washer for the time being, a spacing piece. So we need to get that pin out 
and uh, then we can lift off the hands. But I'll just show you the other way of the hands being retained on a clock like this in case you've got a clock and say, my clock isn't like that, Matthew. It's like um, this. Wish I where my winding key had gone. So similar clock, same maker, a slightly different design, uh, same thing, two hands, a minute hand and an hour hand. And, uh, but you can see there's no pin here. Uh, there's just this kind of washer and you can just see it's got a knurled edge. It's got kind of like machining on the edge and it's got machining on the edge. So you can hold it. Ooh, this is where I should be really left-handed so you can see and unscrew um, that washer there. Right, okay, the minute you think about taking a clock apart, particularly for the beginner, but for everybody, photograph it. Most people, I uh, lost my phone, but anyway, most people have got a mobile uh, smartphone nowadays with a camera built in. Make sketches, do drawings, take dimensions, and make photographs before you take it apart because it's ever so easy to say, I'll remember how it goes back together. And then when it comes to it, uh, you can't. Then the second thing is I've got some uh, paper trays here and um, just to keep the parts in, stop them rolling away and falling on the floor. So um, of course, so many clocks, the hands are fixed on in different ways. So we can only take this as a bit of a guide but our minute hand here simply lifts off. Sometimes you have to give it a bit of help, but it lifts off. And if you can see there's a square hole and that fits on a square on this uh, part in the middle. So that's kind of dead easy. Just goes back on in the same way. Now, you, of course you're thinking now, great, I've got the minute hand off, life's gonna be easy. Um, it's not the same for the hour hand. The hour hand is, fitted um, just as two cylinders that fit together. Um, and to get that off, we have to twist and pull the hand at the same time gently. There we are. And you can see it did actually lift off quite easily. It just fits on a brass pipe there. So already we can see some kind of inconsistencies um, between the two ways. That one might actually, and we'll go back to our other clock and we'll get distracted how they fit together. This is slightly more complicated. Their hands, as I said, they're retained by uh, a pin that's through the middle there. So um, let's get a pair of pliers. So our first kind of tool, what tools do I need? You will need um, screwdrivers and you will need some pliers. Now, when people get going and they say, right, I'm going to commit to this uh, hobby or pastime or profession, um, I would advise them to buy jeweler type pliers. Uh, and they're the ones where the jaws, so the inside here, if I can get the camera to behave, these are actually slightly serrated, are normally smooth. So they don't damage the components that you are um, that you are handling. Now this little pin here, um, can't actually see, but we'll just yeah let's get in focus. Push out in one direction. It's tapered, okay. So it's not parallel like a kind of sewing pin or a needle. Let's just move that across there. And then I'm going to get a pair of. Tweezers. So our next tool, um, a pair of tweezers. These tweezers you buy from, again, from jeweler supplies, that kind of place. And you can see that they're made out of brass. Now I use brass tweezers because it's easy to manipulate the shape at the end here, but also they're a little bit softer than steel. So the parts tend not to ping away and disappear under the skirting board. Um, and these again are relatively inexpensive. So We've used a pair of pliers and we've used a pair of tweezers. Okay, so we just lift off our pin and pop that in our tray. Let's just lift off the hand. The hand here is quite tight. So I'm just gonna slip the tweezers on the back, not touching the dial. And we can see there our collet popped off. Good idea to 
protect the dial with a piece of paper, of course. You can see there are all sorts of marks on here um, just to uh, stop any scratches. So there's the hand, exactly the same as the other one with the square hole in the middle. And I think the um, our hand is going to lift off. I'll just show you that uh, technique with a bit of paper. So if you just, not particularly big, but get a piece of paper or card, cut a V into it, and then slide that under there. Then if you have to gently lever the hand off or put your fingers on the dial, you're not damaging the dial. So again, this is a kind of twist and pull operation. As I said, they're not all like that. So you've got to look. Uh, and we would make notes as we go along. So for instance, here, you can see that the hand isn't straight. It's already bent. So it would have a day book, just like a bench book, a notebook, and make notes as you go along of the kinds of things you might have to repair as you uh, proceed. So there we are. Our, um, uh, our hands are off. And we're now going to begin to start taking the mechanism out of the case. Let me just zoom out a little bit. Now, total word of warning. This clock might have run down. OK, so you might think, well, that spring is not going to have any stored energy in it. It's highly unlikely that a clock runs down completely. In fact, it, it kind of can't really, well, within reason. So top word of warning. There are screws that you can see here inside the case that hold the mechanism in the case. They are the ones we want to undo. We must not, at this stage, undo these four nuts that hold the mechanism together. Otherwise, all the energy in that spring will be released instantly, and the likelihood is it might damage you, but it'll also probably damage some of the mechanism, and seen that many, many times. So make sure that you're 100% confident to take out the movement retaining screws and not the nuts or the screws that hold the movement together. So our third tool, regular kind of flat bladed screwdriver, nothing particularly fancy there. And we're going to um, take out these screws. So one question um, you would ask as a beginner maybe is, are these fittings, these screws and fixings all the same? And the answer to that is uh, yes and no. Just undoing there are four screws. Um, on these kinds of clocks that were machine made, then you can kind of uh, guess, maybe isn't the right word, that um, you can interchange, in this case, those four screws, but not always. You've got to be really careful about that because sometimes, and particularly in things like watchmaking, one screw might be slightly longer than the others, and that can cause you a real problem. So what I'm going to do, again, just as a bit of a demonstration, just undo the screws. So now the, the hands are taken off, and the mechanism, the movement, is actually liberated from the case, so we can just lift it out, okay? Check for any loose parts. So we can pop that down on our bench. But I'll just take one of those case screws, get rid of the case, and just use this same piece of paper. What I would do is, um, uh, for a, advice for a beginner, is that you get some bits of card, or paper in this case, and a knife, and you make some cross-shaped holes in your bit of card and you do a drawing and you mark on where those screws came from. As you build confidence, you can see if you punch a um, slightly nerdy top tip, if you punch a hole in the paper with your tweezers or something, the screws tend to fall out. If you make a cross shape, with a scalpel or something or a craft knife, then they tend to stay in there. So I would write on here, draw a drawing of the shape of the mechanism and uh, write on there what that screw is. Then when you come to put it back, you know where it's from. So um, let's just check how we're doing for time. Okay, we're doing fine. So my next thing is um, stop. 
Right, this is a golden moment, as much as you'll be super excited and enthusiastic to take this puppy apart. Don't do that yet. There are two things to do. One, which we've already mm -hmm. talked about, which is photograph the living daylights out of it, do drawings, and just spend an amount of time, I would say an hour if you can, which seems like a long time, and just look at the relationship between the parts. Now, the clocks people might say, <coughs> might say this is a simple clock. It's not a simple clock. There's no such thing. Look at how many parts are in it. There's like, oh, at least two dozen or something. Many parts. And the good news is that they can only basically go together in one position. So you can get it back together. That's not a problem. We don't break it. Um, but what's really useful now in terms of fault finding is to spend some time and understand the relationship between all these components. And as you go along, learn what the names are. As I said, I'm not hung up too much about the names. People say you've got to call it this, got to call it that. I don't really care. But it's useful to know the names that the um, clocks fraternity call things. So you can talk about it. So you can say, I've got a this or a that. Have you got one? Can I buy one? Et cetera, et cetera. So um, let's just have a quick tour. Now we know what our first component is, don't we? It's in here, it's the mainspring, which is contained within the barrel. Now the mainspring is the first uh, gear in our train, our gearbox. We saw that the mainspring barrel has got teeth on the edge and that engages with a small steel gear on this side. Let's turn it around. There we are which is permanently fixed to a big brass one, which engages with a small steel one, which is fixed to a brass one, which engages with a small steel one, and so on. That's our gearbox. We call it a train. That's our going train in a timepiece clock. Okay. And the reason we've got big gears and small gears meshing together is that gives us a ratio. We talked about duration. We talked about meaningful rotation. For instance, you will recognize now already learning, learning a lot, I hope, that our minute hand goes on that shaft. The shafts, by the way, clocks, people call them arbors, but anyway. So that minute hand goes on that axle shaft or arbor. So you know that this one must make one rotation every hour. It's got to go around once an hour, yeah? And so you can figure out the gear ratios from uh, that point by counting the number of teeth. We did a kind of a, a session on it a couple of weeks ago here. We'll can come back to it. So we've got these gears that are between two brass plates in this case. Most clocks are made out of brass and steel in combination. And there's a very good reason for that. And that reason is that the relative uh, friction or coefficient of friction between brass and steel is actually lower than if you used similar materials together. So for instance, if you had brass and brass working together or brass and steel, uh, steel and steel working together, they would have more friction than brass and steel in combination. That's why you've got brass and steel in clocks, okay. Um, so we've got a set of gears here, but we've got um, these two plates and the plates, these pieces of brass and uh, these uh, cylinders of brass here, which we call pillars, collectively make up the clock frame. So you've got a train running within a frame. At the front um, of the uh, mechanism, you've got two things here. You've got another set of gears, which makes the hands go around in a meaningful relationship to one another. So remember we've got, I'll just pop it back on, um, an hour hand here and a minute hand here. And of course, it's not always the case, um, but we want that minute hand and the hour hand to go around in a 12 to 1 relationship. Every time the hour hand goes around once, the minute hand goes around 12 times to show the time. So all clocks, if you're wearing a watch, it's exactly the same in there. Even a battery watch, like a quartz watch with analog hands, exactly the same mechanism inside there. And that's called, we call it motion work, motion work. and then. Finally, on the front of the mechanism, just get that off again. Um, still looking on for my winding key. On the front of the mechanism, 
down here, we've got maybe the most important part of the whole thing. We have got three components here. One is a wheel with asymmetric teeth. The other is this little uh, mechanism here called a click. And then there's a spring here. And I'm just going to take a couple of minutes out to find the winding key, which I did get and was organized, but have lost it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the plywood drawers. I got them on eBay. Uh, these have got um, files in them. So uh, there's um, for storing your tools and things. I mean, I've only just got this. I've been doing this for years and years. But uh, let's get one that's actually. Right. Impossible to find one that's actually tidy enough to show on air. But I lined them with. Um, bits of corrugated cardboard to put files and small tools and things in there. Um, dust is the dust is the enemy of clocks. We already talked about that a little bit uh, with that oil that you saw that was black. It was contaminated with airborne dust and with um, metal particles from the components wearing. So it's kind of quite nice. Those file, those drawers are not dust free, but to keep dust down to an absolute minimum. Now, a clock case isn't sealed from dust, of course, unlike a watch, which tends to be sealed. So very different kind of environment there. But anyway, the drawers are plywood, and um, I much prefer them to the metal filing cabinet type ones uh, because the tools don't rattle about as much inside, but call me old fashioned. Thinking about dust, thank you for reminding me, <laughs> is that while I'm looking at this mechanism and figuring out how all the parts work and what they're called, I would vacuum out and clean and prepare the clock case. So when you come, when you finish the mechanism, you can put the mechanism straight back in the case and the thing is done. It's really beautiful feeling. You really don't want to put a nice clean mechanism back in a dusty case. So use a vacuum cleaner and a brush to suck out all the dust and dirt and spiders webs and things. Now, do it now wrap up the clock case, and then when you finish the mechanism, it's done. It's like a piece of joy. Otherwise, you end up putting a clean mechanism in a dusty case and it doesn't work out. So clock key. I can't actually find the, um, the one I really wanted. It'll appear right. OK, so important point about clock keys. There are two broad kinds. The, the, the kind like this, which People call it a butterfly key uh, for a kind of obvious reasons. And then there's a kind like <clears throat> it seems like the clock key draw now. Uh, the kind like this, yeah. <clears throat> Never have too many clock keys. When the camera focuses, there we are which is called a cranked uh, clock key. This is from an 18th or 19th century tall case clock or long case clock. Um, and so there's a really broad distinct distinction here that you use the cranked type typically for weight driven clocks and you use the butterfly type for spring driven clocks. So that's not absolutely universal, but um, that's a, a, and especially if you've got a clock with an enameled dial or something, you want to use this type of key because it doesn't put too much sideways force on the, uh, on the uh, winding square and damage the dial. Quite spider keys in, see what I like. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, Open Clock Club wants me to talk about spider keys. I'm really not a great fan, and sorry, of the, um, you might, somebody might say to you, I think I've actually thrown mine away. I used them to make something else. Rattle, rattle, rattle. Yeah, I think I used them to make something else. Anyway, uh, somebody might advise you, this isn't one of them, but it's the same kind of idea, to buy a, a bench clock key thing or something that's got multiple keys sticking out of uh, the same thing. Uh, don't. Just get the proper key that fits the clock. And how do you find out um, if the key fits the clock? Uh, 
and you've got to measure it. Uh, there's, two, I think, at least two different size of uh, the sizing systems. You can see this one says on it 3.5, which is the size in millimeters, and then it says on there number five as well, which is the kind of I don't know where that number numbering system comes from. So the next tool, this is not essential to get started in clock repair, but it is like incredibly useful. Um, it's a digital caliper. You can get mechanical uh, versions and vernier versions as well. Um, but this is a digital caliper. And again, for all sorts of jobs and things around the home or at work or something, just so useful. So we measure this and you can see it measures 3.45 millimeters or thereabouts. And we've got the nearest size, which is 3.5 millimeters. So um, really important that the key is a reasonably good fix. Otherwise it can slip, damage the clock, damage the winding square, and really importantly, damage your fingers. Okay. Oh yeah, they do. Um, some of them, um, again, I'll dig one out of my box if I can find one. There's uh, this kind here, which is a cast steel key from a French clock. Uh, top tip when you're winding with a key like this, don't put your fingers through the key just in case the uh, the ratchet mechanism breaks. And there's um, all sorts of different things. We'll have a whole session on clock keys, maybe. This kind here, which is maybe for a French clock, as you can see, it's got a winding key on one end, and on the other end, it's got a key for setting the hands. Um, English type winding key for a fusey clock. Uh, chronometer type winding key that's got a built-in ratchet mechanism and so on. So yeah, all sorts there. The key thing is, haha, is to make sure that the winding key is a good fit on the square. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, remove uh, this part of the mechanism. So we talked about the spring a bit. We talked about the gear train a bit, the hands a little bit. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is this arrangement here that you can see there are, I'll just hold it a bit close to the camera, uh, two, two components interacting here. One, you might just be able to see, that's better view there, of the final wheel in the train has got asymmetric teeth on it. Not dissimilar actually to this ratchet wheel down here. Um, this is called the escape wheel. Sorry for the terminology. And then we've got a little component here, bent piece of steel in this case, and that's called the pallets. And we don't have time to go into it today, but very happy to do in subsequent weeks. Um, as everybody, by the way, wanted to enter the tool competition, entered the tool competition by giving away tools, posting them uh, wherever you are in the world. In the live chat, put tool competition. Don't put twice, otherwise you get disqualified. Uh, I know who you are. Yeah, Chris. Chris has said it 10 times. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> uh, team Clock Club's dubbing people in now. Uh, as you can see, hopefully, this is for beginners that we try the best we can to be friendly bunch and not to suck to our, through our teeth too much. So this part, these components that I've just described, um, are uh, collectively called the escapement. So we've got a spring energy going through those gears. And what the escapement does is it transfers that energy to the pendulum or the oscillator to keep it ticking. Okay. Now we want to get that out of the way because it's quite a fragile part of our mechanism. But if we were just to take this out, you can see here, there are two uh, screws at the back that retain this whole assembly. You can see the clock's actually trying to take, doesn't even need repairing. The whole thing would start to spin like that clockwork toy that we talked about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to temporarily block the gears with a piece of wire or a bit of string or something like that, if I can find something uh, quickly. So 
So the next tool on your really useful tool list, and again, totally useful around the home or wherever, are cutting pliers. These are quite small, jeweler type. I'd normally use a bigger pair, but can't find them. Um, really incredibly useful things to have around. And in fact, in the tool competition, I think there are two pairs or one and a half pairs anyway. So we can cut off a bit of brass wire. You don't have to use wire, you could use a bit of string. In fact, this is not the best tool for job, but it's what I've got. And I've just passed that through the hole in the wheel. The hole's called the crossing. Well, actually the hole isn't called the crossing. The spoke's called the crossing, but anyway. Um, and I'm going to wrap it around a pillar. And that's just to prevent the gear train from running when we take the escapement out. Okay. So you can see now that it's blocked. It can rotate a bit, but it can't go very far. Now we can safely take these two screws out and remove that whole escapement mechanism or the pallets and the bit that links to the pendulum, which is called the crutch or the leader as one assembly. Thank you. Yeah. Um... So, Why don't you let the spring down first? The reason I don't let the power out of the spring or the wound up spring first is you have to hold the mechanism really firmly like this because we don't want it to cause an accident. And when you're holding it like this, particularly for a beginner, uh, then you're having to squeeze the clock and it might damage the mechanism. So that's the reason that I block the train. And you can see, even though there's power in this spring, the, um, the wheel can't rotate very fast, it can't run down. And what I've done in the meantime, sorry about that, kind of fell out, is to remove this entire rather complicated looking assembly. So as you can see here, the importance of making notes and taking photographs. One thing I should point out is at the top, this is where your pendulum would normally hang. At the top of the pendulum is a spring that just, decouple those two, get rid of that. There's a spring here, look, flexible piece of steel between those two components. And that spring is, it is replaceable, but obviously we don't want to break anything. It's one of the most fragile parts of the whole clock. So I prefer to get this taken out of the way before we begin to let the main spring down because it can cause damage. We'll talk about that in a short while. Okay. So if there's any bit um, to bother paying attention to, it's now, because we're going to release this ratchet mechanism. I did a whole video of it on YouTube. And um, so what you could do is you could get your key. Let's just show you winding it first. So what happens when you normally wind a clock, if you've never done it, you won't be familiar with this. If you've ever had any kind of clock, when you wind it, you can hear a kind of ticking sound. And you can see the little ratchet mechanism there. So when we take our force off the key, all the stored energy in that spring is held back by this little ratchet mechanism. So if you were to flick that up there, there would be kind of a mini explosion, basically. Uh, this would spin round really quickly, would probably damage this, might damage your eyes, anything could happen. So we do not want to do that yet. We must release the energy from the spring. As I say, look at the video of it. And to do that, I'm going to put on uh, my safety gloves, my safety glasses again, and I'm going to use a special kind of key here called a let down key. So this is just a smooth, handled key, but it's got the same square hole in the end. Is that a question? Um, yeah, See, the, the wire that you twisted at the top, Yeah. can you show that and say something, what it is, say something about it? Yeah, okay. So the, the question about the wire at the top, all this wire is doing is it's preventing the clock from running down. We'll just um, take that wire off. And I'll show you what happens. So um, we've got stored energy in here. This spring wants to rotate the barrel. And as we said, because it's um, geared together, all these wheels are interconnected. Uh, when uh, the spring is wound, 
the whole set of gears goes like that. Okay. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Matthew. Why did you bo why bother letting the spring down with this ratchet? Why don't you just let the clock run down? Well, you could. I'm always slightly dubious about that because we don't know what the condition of these bearings is. There might be something already broken. I think letting it run through like this um, is, I, I don't like that really. And also you'd never know that it's completely run down anyway. So what I prefer to do, now the thing is going to disappear off the edge of the bench. What I prefer to do, clockwork toy now is to put a piece of wire or string string would actually be better sorry through one of those holes between the crossings clock wheels typically have got um they're not solid discs of material um the people that make them the clock makers cut away as much material as possible so i'm just wrapping that around that it's a bit clumsy but it'll do the job um, and that blocks it, that prevents it from running away. Clockmakers remove material from within the wheels to reduce their inertial mass. Um, because if you think about clock ticking, they stop, start, in fact, they go back a bit, but anyway. So I've got my safety glasses on. I've got my special mainspring letdown tool. I'm not, um, you might read or hear or see in other books. There are other books on the subject that you can use the key and somehow slot it into a piece of wood. Personally, I'm not a great fan of that. I think there's still a chance of something catching or slipping out. So I'm gonna put on my gloves and I'm going to slowly release that spring. Now I seem to be making an enormous, great big fuss of this, but it is really important. So you can see we can wind the spring, but what I want to do is unwind it so i'm going to get my pointy stick which is here this is why i took the escapement out because that would be on the back plate look and it would easily damage that spring so i'm going to release this uh ratchet click mechanism let's just make sure the camera is going to focus right properly but before I do that, I'm going to take all the force from the spring on this main spring letdown tool. And at the beginning, so I go to wind the clock, you can see that I'm winding it up and the click, the ratchet mechanism is moving out of the way. And with this piece of wood, I'm going to slowly release it, just one tooth, and then let it drop back into engagement. And for the beginner, I strongly suggest you do it this way. One tooth, one tooth, one tooth until you gain a bit of confidence. Then eventually you can slowly let the let down tool rotate in your hand until you're absolutely 100% sure that all the power is off the spring. Remember the spring still wound inside the barrel, but that's another problem for another day. And we can test that now. If we get our um, tweezers or our pointy stick and just check that the wheels are completely loose. They're not under load at all, none of them. So we've let that spring right down. So if you were doing this for the first time, now is the time to give yourself an enormous pat on the back. Congratulations, because you've done one of the most difficult and slightly nerve wracking things uh, to do with health and safety in particular. You've let the power off the spring. So you've got to constantly check that you've done it. Don't go winding the clock again. But now we can take our bit of wire off or string off. Try not to cut through the wheel teeth. And um, you can see that the gears are no longer spinning under the force of the spring. So it's safe to begin to disassemble the mechanism, the movement frame, okay? So we've got about 15 minutes left. So any questions, uh, please ask them now. Yeah. Dear Bashir says, what about if the click spring is very stiff? 
Um, I would still say to let it down. Um, the question was, what happens if the click spring is really stiff? I mean, if what you could do, if you wanted to let the spring down in the way that I showed by letting the train run, is that you could oil all the bearings, if you know how to do that, deal that, and then you could let it run through slowly, controlling the speed of the thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, if you can wind the clock with the key, then you should be able to release the mechanism. Now, there are um, uh, exceptions to that. And one is on a fusee clock. We mustn't go there today. But where the click is actually hidden inside a mechanism or on a little clock like this, a sort of uh, spring-driven clock, where the manufacturer doesn't ever intend anybody to ever let the spring down is more complicated. So you've kind of got to be creative. The point is you've got to figure out a way of doing it and doing it safely. Because if you undo these nuts and you take the frame apart and there's power on that spring, you're going to cause damage to yourself or the clock or both. Joseph says, can you ever overwind a clock? <clears throat> no, great question, Joseph. Thank you. Can you overwind a clock? I used to work in a jeweler shop and all the time people say I've overwound my um over on my watch on my clock you can't what happens is that for whatever reason the clock or the watch stops okay so you think kind of like you know when your car's making that funny noise and you're on the freeway you think if i just put my foot down a bit more on the gas it'll be fine i'll turn the radio up and that's what people do quite understandably they get the winding key and they wind it even tighter and often that actually makes it worse sometimes it can even tear or break the mainspring. So no, you can't overwind the clock per se, not a spring-driven clock like this anyway. Um, but what you can do is that if the clock stops and it won't run, people do tend to wind the spring very tightly into the barrel, which can cause a whole load of problems itself. A tall case clock or um, a long case clock in Europe, yes, you can wind those weights too high and they either jam or uh, butt up against uh, the underneath of where the mechanism is housed. So that can be problematic. But on a spring-driven clock, no. And people who have never wound the clock, you kind of, again, need to... What I would suggest if you're a beginner is that with the wheel blocked, is that you wind it and you release it, you wind it and you release it uh, several times in order to get a feel for how strong that spring is. Because on these 20th century mantle clocks, the springs are incredibly strong. Again, somewhere... I make a video of um, I make a video of releasing a spring, and believe me, it's quite a scary thing. So no, you can't overwind a spring-driven clock like this. But what you can do is break something by winding it too much. And I think maybe relating to um, Debashish's question about if the spring's really stiff, yeah, if the spring's really been wound, uh, then you might actually want to let the train run through a little bit like this. But please, if you can, check that there's oil on the bearings to start with before you do that. So the next thing we're going to do, just letting this run down, is um, in our last 10 minutes that we've got remaining, uh, before we finish, uh, turn some time fly when we're having fun. Um, let's just check that out. Yeah, I'll just talk about a couple of things because we're not going to get the thing taken apart and put back together. I will just take the, the movement out and you can look at the, the wheels. If you've kind of interested in this and hopefully it's encouraged some people to take up clock repairing as a hobby for well-being or maybe even first steps as a professional on that point alone if you're willing to commit to the training and there are some great training centers in england uh, there's a place called west dean college which is down in sussex there's the birmingham school of virology which is in birmingham a famous jewelry center and then there's a british Horological Institute, which I think offer training programs and so on. I would look up all their websites. There's um, an organization called the Antiquarian Horological Society, who are again a really friendly bunch of people. They've got a great journal. Uh, look them up. I'll put some links in the in the recording of this video. Um, the British Horological Institute run uh, like local, uh, what I think in the States are called chapter meetings. Again, I would encourage you to go along for one of those. If somebody says, 
you know, horology needs lots of tools and lots of layers and equipment, then just ignore them. I'm sure they'll look after you. And in the States, there's the NAWCC, which is the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. Um, and again, they've got an online forum, like a Facebook forum thing. It's not on Facebook, it's on their own website. And I'm sure if you go there, you will get lots of friendly help and advice. So where next? Please don't be put off uh, by what's been quite a lot of information tonight, even by my standards. Um, you can take a reasonably simple clock like this, take it apart, wash it, put it back together and get the thing running and bring that forgotten treasure back to life, which is kind of what we're about. Um, so session your questions where next one next one right yeah has everybody who wanted to enter the competition entered the competition i'll give you one more minute yes is the answer is it right okay well we're going to do the draw in a minute but i'm going to take some more parts of this clock first so uh to get our gears off here the ones that control the hands called the motion work you can see there's a sir clip you ever seen one of those things before um let's just use our pliers to slip that off there, that was kind of easy. And then there's another washer. Again, this is the importance of making notes because you can see that that washer is again, it's different on the outside from the inside. So you'd want to take a photograph and make a note of that. And then these components, this is called the uh, cannon wheel and this component here, which is called the minute wheel, um, uh, it's just slip off, that's dead easy. Let's get rid of that little washer and put it safe. Um, then double, triple checking that all the power is up our spring. We're going to remove this little wheel here on the front that's part of that winding mechanism. So there's a screw. So hopefully on the tools front, you know, what have we used so far? We've used a pair of pliers, a screwdriver, a letdown key, bit of safety equipment, glasses and uh, safety gloves. So hopefully not been too bad on the kind of uh, tools and equipment front. Let's just move that out of the way and lift this wheel off. There's often a bit of oil under there that kind of sticks it on. Um, so I think, you know, getting it back together again, lots of photographs. So we've taken off everything we can from the outside of the mechanism. And uh, we haven't talked about um, cleaning yet, um, but all these components in our book, we suggest that you'll need something like a paint decorator's tray or a, I use these photographic um, developing trays. Do you remember in the old days, old people when they used to have a film inside a camera? Anyway, they're really good because they're chemical resistant. A paintbrush, some nitrile gloves these ones are a bit thicker for resisting chemicals um, and in a well ventilated space you basically wash those components in mineral spirits dry them and we reassemble i'm oversimplifying it because we're kind of running out of time uh please come back next week and uh ask questions and um and uh, uh and, and maybe progress your ideas we're very happy to, um, to build these sessions around what people want. Um, there's no point in really me just banging on for the sake of it, because it doesn't get us anywhere. Before I take the last part of the mechanism apart, we're gonna do the draw. So drum roll, I'll go get the, the hat. not actually a hat it's <laughs> kitchen utensil but anyway so uh here we go without looking rustling you hear the rustling of the paper here it is so the tools have been won by uh michael now uh, that's on the basis that we don't have two michaels do we only have one michael yes right we've apparently we've only got one michael logged on today so wherever michael is if he drops us a line, uh, either in the live chat, um, no, don't put it in the live chat, sorry. Um, but if he drops us a line or direct messages on Facebook or through any of our email addresses, how to repair pendulum clocks and get in touch with us, 
send us your address and we'll post those tools off to you. And as I always joke at this point, no doubt Michael works on the Antarctic uh, ice station there and it's like the most expensive. Michael's in York. Michael's in York, yay, great. <laughs> I can go around on my bike, brilliant. All right, Michael, you're always welcome to Wind Tools. They normally have been California or Canada or some other place, so great. York, Michael of York, brilliant. That's really good, it's made my day. So let's just um, use a spanner. I've got a little brass spanner here because we don't want to mark the frame. Well, I haven't, I haven't talked about lots of things here, but um, it's not overt in these groups or on Facebook, but um, you know, I'm a conservator by profession, believe it or not. So I try and employ and encourage wherever possible conservative practice. So I don't use any ammoniated solutions to clean the clocks. I try not to refinish if I can help it. And that, of course, it also involves a lot of thinking and so on. Not that other types of practice don't, um, but things like taking those nuts off, it's ever so easy to damage the frame. And you can see there's already quite a lot of wear around there. So I guess people um, just have to ignore that. So we're lifting off this, this part of the mechanism, the back plate, and you can see there the holes drilled in the plate that are the bearings. And again, if you're a beginner, this is where you stop, take photographs and make notes of the relationship between these components. Now let's just talk a bit more about the names of these things, because these names have all got different, these wheels have all got different names, so we know uh, which is which. I think my computer's about to uh, um, stop as well. Uh, so we've got one, two, three, four, five wheels in this gearbox, in this wheel train. The bottom one we know is called the barrel, and the wheel that's fixed to the barrel is called the great wheel, typically, great wheel. And then we've got one here, the other end of which has got that minute hand on it. So we call that the center wheels, typically near or at the center of the clock. This one here is only part of the gearing. So it doesn't have any function per se, uh, uh, other than being part of the gearing. So that's just called an intermediate wheel. It just gears uh, the train. But let's lift that out. You can look at it. Um, can we get that out without? Uh, maybe not, actually. Let's have a look. Yeah, there we go. So we've got our intermediate wheel, and we've got this small steel gear permanently fixed to that wheel. Um, again, just to see if we can improve the focus situation. There we are. Okay, so that's one mobile, we call it. You see the crossings there, the five crossings. So the small steel gears are typically called pinions, not gears for some reason, but anyway. Let's lift this one out, which is the upper intermediate wheel. Some clocks people call this the third wheel, but it's not the third wheel in the train. So I try and avoid that uh, as much as it causes me endless grief, but um, I'm gonna call it the upper intermediate wheel. Same thing you can see, if you've never seen inside a clock before, bit of brass and a bit of steel riveted together. I'm going to get this one out here, which is called the escape wheel. We had a little look at that before. Part of our escapement interacts with those things called pallets, just the ticking and the talking in the clock. You can see that these wheels or the axles or the arbors have got reduced diameters at the end. They're the bearings or one half of the bearing. And they're quite vulnerable because they're small diameters. They're easy to bend or break reasonably anyway. Um, and then... We can just about, I think, get, yeah, just slip out our barrel, which is kind of where we started, isn't it? So we've got our barrel with a barrel cap and barrel arbor, and that is where the, um, the winding key goes. And you can see the spring lock inside there, still doing its stuff. So we haven't cleaned our clock. Uh, we haven't got it fully as disassembled yet but at least you've had a chance to see what's involved. And as I said, the whole point of this, uh, this process is part of the York Festival of Ideas. Thank you, of course, the York Festival of Ideas for uh, having us and putting us in their catalogue. Hope you've enjoyed it. Is to give you some idea, some realistic idea of the kind of environment you need 
the kind of clock that we advise you to begin with, the kinds of tools that you might need, hopefully not too intimidating or, or um, expensive. Now, obviously, we would clean this clock and then we would go through the reverse process of putting it back together again. Um, this is absolutely not about plugging our product. Uh, this is all in our book, of course, it says. But I think more importantly, we run this Facebook group. Uh, we've got YouTube videos. Look, um, check us out on Facebook. It's how to repair pendulum clocks. As I said, all very friendly, hopefully very supportive. Um, we are over time, so it's time to call it today. As always, um, massive thank you to team Open Clock Club who's been doing the live chat. Thank you to our regulars. Um, we'll be back on Thursday live on YouTube on our live stream channel, fixing a tall case clock. We would love to see you there. We'll no doubt see some of you on Facebook and we'll be back here the same time, same place with um, our Open Clock Club number 31. And uh, by the way, it's lovely if you sign up every week. But if you want to come back next week, I think you can use the same login details so you don't necessarily have to sign up again on Eventbrite. And if it hasn't been for you, I'm sorry about that. But uh, thanks for your time anyway. And don't forget, if you want to unsubscribe, go to Eventbrite and unsubscribe from there. So no doubt there are lots of uh, questions in the live chat, which we'll try and get to some of them on Facebook. Well done to... Michael from York for winning the tool giveaway. That's great. I can pop on my bike and deliver those during the week. So thanks very much. Uh, great to see you all. Hope this has been of use and hope it's been encouraging to beginners who want to get into clock repair. So I'll, I'll leave the uh, thing open for a couple of minutes so you can all say goodbye and then we'll sign off and I'll send a, a link to the video later. Thanks very much and bye for now. <laughs>